you very much. I'm um, very happy to be here at DevOps Days Boston. Uh, I think this full room is proof that if you throw enough buzzwords into your title, people will come to your talk. <laughs> um, I only realized after submitting this abstract and getting accepted that I was probably going to have to come up with a punchline for this, or else there'd be a big disappointment, um, which I did. If you stick around to the end, I promise a very, very lame joke. <laughs> uh, but I want to start with a quick story. This is about a project that I worked on a um, little more than a year ago. And we had a client come to us, and they had this really cool piece of technology. And they wanted us to build this, this cloud platform for it. And um, there's NDAs involved, so I can't specifically talk about the client or the technology, but it doesn't really matter. Basically, this, this piece of technology, this hardware, was going to collect a bunch of data, and it would be fed into this cloud platform. They do a bunch of machine learning stuff, and then it could solve all these really interesting problems for a bunch of different people. So they were really excited about this, and, and I was really excited. Uh, opportunity to kind of build this really greenfield. So, you know, we started and went on to, you know, design this ideal architecture, right? So everything was, was microservices from the start, everything in containers, uh, running on Kubernetes in the cloud, uh, using message queues, event-driven, all the stuff that you're supposed to do. Uh, and things were coming along pretty well. Uh, we were nearing kind of the, at least the, the alpha release of this platform. And then we have a meeting with the client and they say, hey, we have good news. Uh, we actually found somebody who wants to use this platform. And I was like, well, I guess, yeah, that's probably important, somebody actually using this. And they said, yeah, so can you take that, that platform you built uh, and run it on one of their servers inside their closed private network? So <laughs> as frustration slowly turned in, into kind of this realization that, you know, these weren't crazy demands on their side, right? Uh, the, the learning that I eventually came to is that you know, there is no ideal architecture. Everything depends on context. Uh, it depends on the business case that you start from. And you can design this, you know, beautiful, perfect system, but if you don't have a proper use for it, then, then what's the point? And so this is kind of what it inspired me to throw this talk together. And this is what I wanna, one of the things I wanna talk about is this idea of an ideal architecture and what is it or, or what are the different architectures we can use. So, already thrown this term uh, around a bit so far today. And architecture, I think, is, you know, it's obviously a term that, that we've borrowed from somewhere else. Uh, and maybe in the early days it had a better fit, but I think more and more this is, the metaphor is not working very well. So we think of architectures for buildings, this is a lot of design work which is done fully up front and then gets handed off to this other team, this other company to go and build things. And the architecture is pretty much static for the entire life cycle. But I think in software architecture, this is really not the case anymore. You know, architectures that we build and design are gonna constantly be changing. And we need to think about that when we, when we build architecture. So if we can't take the architecture metaphor from buildings anymore, then how do we define it? Well, there's not really that many great definitions of this. I and mean, I was kind of searching through and the, the best definition that I like the most uh, came from Martin Fowler and he's actually quoting Ralph Johnson. So architecture is the important stuff whatever that is. And it seems kind of like a funny definition, but it's, it's also pretty powerful. I mean, architecture, it's the important things, right? These are the things, the decisions that we want to get right at the start because they're going to be harder to change later. And the second part, you know, whatever that is, because it's, it depends. Every project is going to be different what the important things are. And that means the architecture is going to be different for every different system. But even with all this, you know, there have been some trends. Right, if we kind of go way back and look at kind of mainframes and how we moved into client server architectures and to three tier and then into microservices, you can see this trend of slowly splitting things into smaller and smaller pieces. So when you kind of think of these trends, you'd be forgiven to come to this kind of a conclusion, as I have myself. Right, we had monoliths, okay, they were all right for a while, and then we moved to microservices, and microservices are better. And then serverless comes along and we split things even into smaller pieces and serverless is obviously better. But I think this is essentially not true. And that's kind of realization I came to is it, it depends, you know, on your business case, on your context, which architecture is better. So I wanna quickly run through each of these three, uh, just kind of at a high level, talk about some of their pros and cons and some of the use cases. And I know this doesn't blanketly cover all types of uh, architectures. There's many different styles out there, but I think these are the common three terms that, that we're using a lot today. 
So if we start with the monolith, um, you know, how do we define this? It's kind of a blanket term, right? But generally a monolith, we think of things being all one single piece. And the most important part of that is, is deployment. If we have to deploy our system, our application, uh, all together, then even if it's separated, it's, this is essentially a monolith we have. And there are different types. The most common would be a single process, right? Everything is run as a single process in, for example, like a jar file. There are also this idea of modular monoliths. Believe it or not, you can have nice, well, uh, well architected monolithic architectures. Um, and then you can even try and go the distributed route. But if you end up with all these different dependencies uh, and coupling, and if you still have to deploy everything together, you still essentially have a monolith. But there are some advantages of this kind of architecture, right? First of all, they're very quick to build. So if I'm starting for something from scratch, this is probably the route that I'm going to take because it's much quicker, especially with a small team, to just get something built and get something working. They're more performant in certain aspects. If we think of you know, everything running in a single process, all of these function calls are a lot quicker than anything that has to go across the network. Simple, I'll put a bit of a caveat there, but in a general, if our architecture is you know, this one big piece, it's much easier to reason about. It's easier to plan for things like deployment. Of course, there are some drawbacks as well. Maintenance is inherently difficult in monoliths. The more a monolithic application, the longer it lives, the harder and harder it is to get to maintain these things and the slower they start to end up into this whole big ball of mud. Deployments can be very difficult. Even changing a small piece of your application, if you have to deploy the whole thing, you're never entirely sure how it's going to affect the rest. And so deployments always become these really scary idea where you know, every, we have a bunch of people on call and just waiting to see if something goes wrong. And then we're kind of locked into the technology choices we make at the beginning. You know, the programming language you choose, the database, for example, we're more or less stuck with those uh, for the life cycle of this. But with these pros and cons in mind, there are use cases where it's the right fit. So things like proof of concept or prototypes. Again, if we're starting from scratch, uh, monolith is just much quicker to build, so it's probably the better use case. If we only have a single team, you know, maybe building just a small, medium-sized application, then why bother with, with anything else? I think monolith might still be a good fit. Or if we have something that's just very well defined, and uh, once it's built, we don't expect a lot of changes coming around, then maybe we should think about a monolithic style application. So from there, we move on to microservices. Uh, and to define this, I will I'll leave that to Sam Newman. So he defines microservice uh, as independently deployable services, which are modeled around a business domain. So then it necessarily follows that a microservice architecture is composed of many different microservices. And there are certain qualities that we kind of expect. They're small, hence the name. They're scalable, elastic. Uh, they should be resilient, fault tolerant. These are all characteristics um, that we want to build into good microservices. Of course, there are some advantages. Uh, our design is much more flexible. You know, it's easier to swap out different pieces, um, adding in functionality. We can, again, choose the technology that we want. Maybe something fits better in a different language. Easier to scale. If I'm you know, running into bottlenecks with my application and you know, I need to run another instance or I need to you know, be able to handle more traffic, well, I can only scale the piece that specifically needs it rather than running an entire instance of my whole monolithic application. And kind of from the Conway's Law sort of things, you know, it does match nicer with larger organizations when you have many different teams. You know, we can assign certain teams a microservice or several microservices. They don't need to know or understand the design of the entire system. They have their specific domain they can build, and then they interface with the rest uh, through well-designed APIs. So of course, there's some drawbacks here as well. Uh, all the complexity which may have existed in these, these complex monolith, it now moves to the network. And these can be very difficult to kind of track what's going on. Uh, we can, you've probably all seen these dependency diagrams from you know, Netflix and Amazon where they match all the dependencies between their different microservices. And it can be very, very complicated to try and, uh, try and understand that. Uh, latency, as we mentioned, all of these 
nice quick function calls we had before, they're now, all now going over the network. And these services are probably even running on different physical machines. So they're gonna be a bit slower. And there is a bit of a learning curve with microservices themselves and all of the new technologies which tend to come with it. So this needs to be taken into account. In terms of use cases, again, if we have large organizations with many teams, we might think about a microservices approach. It might fit better uh, with our team structures. If we have a well-defined domain that we really understand well, and we're able to draw these boundaries uh, between our services and be pretty confident, then again, microservices might be a good fit. But I think the most common use case is, hey, we started with the monolith, and we've kind of reached the boundaries. We've reached the limits, so maybe now it's time to, to move to something else. So this brings us to serverless. Uh, I thought I was really clever here. This is a serverless data center. <laughs> Apparently, I'm, I'm far from the first person to make this joke. Um, so again, to define this, I'll, I'll let someone else do this job. So this is from uh, Mike Roberts. And here, we're kind of distinguishing on the, the function as a service side of serverless. So he defines it as essentially this is logic which run in stateless compute containers that are event triggered, ephemeral, and fully managed by a third party. So I'll break that down quickly, right? Their applications, you know, they're running in this, these stateless containers. So this enforces certain characteristics. Uh, event triggered, and these events could be, you know, could be API calls, could be, could be from message queues, could be anything. Ephemeral, so they're not going to stick around. So again, we have to build this into our assumptions. And I think most importantly, fully managed by a third party. This is the main promise of serverless, right? That somebody else is taking care of these servers somewhere. So some of the advantages of this um, cost savings. So the idea that, you know, the, the pay for what you use model. And this could be in your monthly cloud bill, but it could also be in terms of just compute and resources if you have an internal uh, platform. This idea of invisible infrastructure. So yes, of course, there are servers somewhere, but the idea is that we really don't care. There is this fully managed platform, be it a cloud provider, be it your own internal team, uh, and they take care of everything infrastructure. I need just to worry about um, actually just running my application or writing my application. And security, again, with a, a little asterisk here, basically the security is now the responsibility of this third party. And as a developer, there's less things that I can do wrong. Uh, there's less risk involved in me uh, in a serverless application. So some drawbacks, of course. Uh, vendor lock-in, especially in the early days where kind of Lambda was the only game in town. Uh, if you really want to take advantage of this, you, you're going all in. And vendor lock-in isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is a decision that should be made uh, consciously. Debugging serverless applications, uh, still very difficult and complicated. And it's still, you know, even though we've been talking about serverless for a long time, I feel like it's still fairly immature in terms of the tools out there. And it's only recently that there's been more um, kind of production ready platforms that are available. So we think of some use cases, you know, we talk about event driven uh, architectures. This is probably a good fit, right? These, these functions that we're building are going to be triggered by events. So this might be a nice fit. Any type of asynchronous tasks. So maybe we're running some machine learning jobs or, or things that just uh, uh, you know, have to run for a certain amount of time, uh, but it's less predictable. That might be good for a serverless pattern. But I think most importantly is you need to have this platform already available. So maybe you're already on a cloud provider that has a serverless platform or you have some internal team uh, but I wouldn't go out and build a serverless platform just to take advantage of a serverless architecture. I think then the cost doesn't really uh, outweigh the benefits. So if we have the statement that you know, none of these are the ideal architecture and it kind of depends on your use case, then how do we choose? How do we choose which one to go with, you know, say we're starting from scratch? Well, you know, we look at our, our specific use case, our specific context, uh, look at the pros and cons of each of these and try and see which one is the right fit. But thing is, it's not either or. For any you know, medium to large system, you're probably going to have at least two of these styles of architectures in there. There's also some good news and some bad news when designing an initial architecture. The good news is that 
you know, you're not designing this architecture which is going to live forever. You know, this is not way back where, okay, we'll, a bunch of architects sit in a room, we'll design this for five years, and we'll see you again in five years to do the next one. Our architectures are going to change. So this kind of puts a little bit of the pressure off when designing it. The bad news, well, your architecture is actually going to change. So you can't just, you know, design this and then hand it off and you're done. You know, architecture needs to be done continuously. You also need to think about how change is going to affect the architecture that you design. Now, I'm not sprouting some new idea here. Uh, there are several different ideas and concepts which are kind of around this same theory, and I want to just highlight a couple of them. Um, Michael Nygaard, who, who wrote the, the great book Release It, uh, he has some really good talks uh, as well. He does some workshops called Architecture Without an End State, uh, and I'd highly recommend uh, finding one of his talks online. And essentially, he talks about this, you know, this, especially in the enterprises, this, this fallacy of the three-year plan, where we design our architecture, and then you know, this is set for the next three years. And he says that you never reach those three years, because change is inevitable. Whether it's the technology, uh, whether it's the, you know, the business direction, uh, whether it's the people. So we need to stop thinking in these kind of ways, and again, bring architecture into more of a continuous process. A similar kind of idea uh, is just the idea of evolutionary architecture. Uh, and you can read about this, again, a really good book, Building Evolutionary Architectures, uh, by Neil Ford, Rebecca Parsons, and Patrick Kua. And, you know, again, they're talking about this idea as architecture is something which needs to evolve. And they have some very practical ideas in there about measuring the evolvability of your system. Uh, they have this concept of fitness functions, which essentially is a way to you know, measure uh, your architecture for different things so that we have a guided evolution. It's not just random how our architecture evolves, but we make sure it evolves in the way that we want. And I think this also all kind of fits into the, the idea of cloud native. If you kind of get the, the buzzwords out of the way and, and all the technology, it's about building systems, you know, meant for the cloud. So this means taking advantage of infinite compute, but also being able to handle, you know, failures. Uh, there's less and less control that we have. So now we want to build resilient systems. We want to build systems that can respond to change. So of course, the common thread that we're going throughout here uh, is that you know, change is something which, which is inevitable, even in our architecture. So we need to start thinking about this uh, as we're designing and as we're continuously uh, changing our systems. So then the question is, how do, we, you know, how do we build our systems for change? How do we make this easier? Uh, and I'd like to, you know, Sorry, there's, there's a couple ways. Um, one way is kind of the big rewrite, right? We have this system and, you know, it's not really working anymore, so we're just going to throw it out and build a new system. We're going to now replace our monolith with, with serverless. And, you know, I've kind of heard some, some talks around these lines, but I don't know how many organizations who have, like, six months to just put everything on hold and, and rewrite the entire system. And I personally have never seen this actually pan out. So how do we do this more continually? And this is something that we've, you know, we've already learned in the software world, right? This idea of small, quick iterations, you know, bringing risk down early, delivering value quickly and constantly. And so it's the same kind of idea on, on the architecture level. We want to be doing very quack, quick iterations, you know, running experiments and letting our architecture evolve over time. So we want to move more to like kind of a constant migration. Uh, and to try and bring this back into maybe a little bit more concrete, look at ways that we can actually do this. So we have our architecture, we have maybe a monolith, and we want to start migrating this, be it to microservices or serverless, or starting to introduce some new pattern. You know, there's kind of some common steps that we want to go through. So we want to identify the piece uh, that we're going to start with. So find the seam, right, in our system. And this is the new piece which we're going to eventually replace with be it a, a function or a microservice. So then we, you know, we pull it out, and this could just be you know, rewriting it or pulling the existing logic into a, a microservice, for example. And we might leave the existing piece in there. We redirect the traffic, uh, usually kind of slowly, so slowly start feeding the traffic uh, to the new system, the new service. And there are good tools that can, that can help you do this. And we need to have proper monitoring in place, of course, so that we know, you know what's happening. Are we getting the same results? 
our error rate's going up. And once we're finally happy that, hey, this new service you know, performs at least as good as the old one, uh, then we can retire and throw out the old piece. Uh, and then we just repeat. We go through this constant iterative process. So again, to try and make this a little bit more concrete, um, I'm gonna go into a, a live demo here because those always go very well. Um, so I've got this application. It's a little bit more than, than a hello world. Um, what it's trying to do is, is to find missing people. So this is kind of a logical flow. Uh, it takes in images from a variety of cameras in theory. Uh, it's gonna process and ingest those. Uh, it's gonna try and detect faces if it can find those in the images. Uh, if we detect some face, we're gonna do some encoding. Um, and then we'll search in our database to see if, hey, if these match any of the people that we're happy to be looking for. Uh, if so, okay, do some notification. Uh, otherwise, maybe we'll add this new face to our database and, and update our, our data, eventually send this to some UI. Um, so the, the first architecture, we're building this thing from scratch. Uh, again, a monolith is probably the right way to go. We just wanna you know, build something quickly. So the, the high level architecture is fairly simple. Uh, we have a large backend, which is our monolith. We connect to a database uh, and there's a very small front end on the front. Uh, so let's quickly show this initial version. Uh, da, da, da. Hopefully that's big enough. So even though it's a monolith, of course, I'm gonna run this on Kubernetes because, hey, that's what we do. Um, <laughs> so I've got three pods running, three applications running on my Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I've got the database, this front end, and this monolith. Um, so now if I go to the UI, Uh, as you can see, I'm not a UI UX designer by any stretch, <laughs> my terrible skills. Uh, and we do have a small load test, which is essentially gonna simulate uh, images coming in from cameras. Uh, so we start running this, and hopefully things happen. There we go, so we're getting these events coming up. Hey, we've detected a person with this ID in this location, and we've got this cool globe showing where they are. Uh, cool. So that. That kind of works. Um, and then we get to, you know, we put these things in production and um, we start increasing traffic and, you know, we start to hit some bottlenecks. Uh, and then things start to go pretty slow. You're just gonna have to trust me on this because I've actually knocked over the cluster a few times by putting the, the traffic up too high. So it, it will, will definitely break. And so there's a couple of options we can do here, right? We wanna scale our application, so maybe we can just run another instance of this monolith. Uh, but if we're already hitting the limits, maybe another option is, hey, let's look at where the bottleneck is. And in this case, we find out that um, the limits it's hitting is actually around this, this base encoding. It's a pretty intensive process. Uh, it's taking a lot of time, a lot of CPU. So another option is take this logic, and we're gonna pull this out as, as a microservice and try to integrate this together. So again, we're finding this, we're going through these same steps, right? We find the seam, so this is around our specific uh, encoding piece of functionality. We're gonna pull it out and then redirect our traffic so that our old backend just calls this new piece. We can even leave the existing logic in there for now until we're confident. So the version two of our architecture, very similar, we just have this other service which we've now ripped the exact same logic out and, and put it in its own piece. Uh, so if we go and Deploy this. Uh, this one. Yes. So what this is doing, so this is just updating uh, the monolith backend to now call the new service and it deploys the new service. So if I see what I have running now, uh, this is the old version going away, this is the new version, and this is our new service which we created. Uh, pretty straightforward. So then if I go back and run my load test again and see what happens. You know, essentially functionality wise, we didn't change anything. So as we can see, everything still seems to be the same from the user's <coughs> perspective. But what we gained is a much easier ability to actually scale things. So now what I can do if I, you know, once I'm hitting these limits, uh, I can say, 
cube CT that'll scale. And I only have to scale this one piece, right? This actual encoding. Uh, if I can remember the syntax. And say we want to run four instances. Then if I see what's running, you know, now I have four versions of this small encoding service instead of multiple versions of my big monolith. So this is kind of the benefit that we get. And now I'm able to handle a whole lot more traffic. So, you know, we've, we've kind of improved things. We've, we've, we're getting a little bit better. And again, this is a small kind of iterative approach just to, to slowly change our architecture. Now imagine a, you know, another similar use case or a different use case where we actually want to add functionality. And I want to be able to, for example, add alerts, add notifications if we actually find a match between some people. And so, of course, for alerts, we're going to put these in Slack because that's where all important information goes. And we think, you know, this is actually kind of an asynchronous task. Maybe this fits in well um, with kind of a serverless pattern. And again, one of the stipulations I kind of put there was if you don't have uh, a platform actually available, then it doesn't really make sense. Uh, luckily, so I'm running this on uh, Google Cloud on GKE. Um, so they have something called Google Cloud Run, which is essentially just a managed version of Knative. Uh, Knative is the serverless platform on Kubernetes. I think this is it's kind of one of the more mature serverless platforms currently available. So because I have this available and I want to build this new logic, um, then it's, it's quite easy for me to, to integrate these two things, right? I just need to build the actual logic uh, for my new service. Uh, I don't need to care about, you know, setting all my Kubernetes configurations anymore uh, or think about the infrastructure or think about scaling. So this is what the, the next version looks like. Again, we've just added this one piece, which is for alerting. Uh, we're going to add this as a, as a function. So to do this, uh, yes. Um, so what I'm actually going to do uh, is just, so this is a set image command. So all I'm doing is showing you that the only thing that changes is the version of the, this monolith backend. So it's now going to version three. And the thing in version three is that, again, when it finds a match, now we're going to trigger this, uh, this function, which is out there. And then in order to uh, actually deploy my, my function, so again, I said I'm using Google Cloud Run. Uh, so I'll use their CLI, which is pretty straightforward. All I'm specifying here is uh, the image. So this is the, the Docker image of, of my new service. Uh, and then I'm pointing it to my existing Kubernetes cluster to say, hey, go you know, run this on, on your serverless platform and, and make sure it's available. And then it takes care of making sure that this is visible as a normal service to, to all of my rest of my existing applications. So seemingly this should be uh, now up and running. Um, so now if we go and run our load test, we should see new things happening. We see that the load is, is coming up. And then in theory, uh, if we see a match now, we should get uh, some kind of a notification. I think there's only like 20 or so people in my, in my load test. So eventually, we should hopefully get a match. Um, and then this, what happens is so the back end will just trigger, um, trigger this new service, which is running on, on Cloud Run. Oh, just, just a quick. It time did I just didn't get a notification? Just a quick time check. Uh, less than ten minutes to the next session, so. Um, Good thing my demo just worked then. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have my notifications up, but it's. <laughs> like we find it. So you can see now this new serverless function just, just sends a message to Slack whenever we find a, a person. So I can kill that. Um, cool. So we've kind of, you know, we see this slow evolution of, of our architecture, right? Um, and our, you know, so we're not, we're not done here. Uh, the idea is, again, that this is something which continuously happens. So we can, you know, slowly migrate our system to microservices or to service lists as it, as it makes sense. 
Uh, and while these are you know, a little bit trivial examples, I think the process is the same. You know, we want to follow this plan of identifying the piece that we want to replace, you know, finding a good reason, uh, you know, building the new piece, uh, routing your traffic, and there's tools that can you know, do intelligent traffic switching. Uh, and then monitor to see that, that things have actually improved. We should be running these things ex as experiments, right? So I say that you know, I have a hypothesis that if I pull this piece of logic out and run it as a service, uh, I'm going to reduce my cost by x. You, know, you can quickly run this experiment, gather the data, and you know, did this succeed or pass? And then you've got, you've got that data available. And if it didn't, that's fine. You know, roll back and continue. But again, it's this idea that this is something we should be doing continuously. So kind of to summarize here, again, this, this idea of an ideal architecture, it, it doesn't exist. It really depends on your context, on your specific use case, uh, on the business domain that you're in. And these things need to be taken into consideration. And even once you have it designed, the, the change is going to be inevitable, you know, from technologies which are changing, from business directions, from everything. Uh, so you need to take this into account when you're initially designing and as well throughout the whole process. So in order to be constantly changing our, our architectures, you know, we want to be running this uh, as experiments, constantly iterating, uh, you know, making changes, seeing if they're valid or not, you know, moving back when we can. That's all I have. Thank you. I, I did owe you one lame joke, I promise. <laughs> so a monolith, a microservice, and a function walk into a bar. And they go and grab a table over by the corner. And the function says, hey, friends, I just got paid, so, so drinks are on me. So she goes off to, to grab some drinks. She's gone for a little, bit of, a little bit of a, kind of a long time. Eventually comes back, and the monolith says, hey, you were gone all this time, and you, you still don't have any drinks. And the function says, well, I looked everywhere, but there was no server. <laughs> Sorry, apologize. <laughs>